Hello, class, and I'd like to welcome our next guest speaker, Ayal Malinger from Berengia. Ayal, welcome. Thank you very much. So, Ayal, can you share with us uh, what Berengia does and what you do for them? Sure. So, uh, Berengia, we're a UK and US based venture capital fund. Uh, we manage over $600 million between both our UK and the US fund. We call ourselves early growth investors. What this means is we look at companies that have proven market, a product market fit, have a proven product, are generating over a million or $2 million in revenues. Uh, and we provide anywhere between two and $7 million of capital to help them grow. Um, the companies we look to invest in usually are, I call them, they make money and they're in the non-unicorn category. So they're real businesses that just require capital for growth. Uh, the kind of money we manage uh, is a bit longer term in nature. So the returns we look for are slightly lower than a typical VC fund. Um, uh, so so th that's a bit about, about our fund. Um, I've been with the fund for, uh, for about a year and a half now. Uh, I'm a Harvard uh, alum, uh, so I have a strong connection to the school. Um, and I guess my interest in blockchain comes also, and real estate comes from my previous work. Uh, I was head of corporate development at a company called Countrywide. Countrywide is the UK's largest uh, property services business. So this is the largest broker, uh, both for sales and lettings in the residential space. It's the largest uh, mortgage uh, valuer and mortgage surveyor. So it's a very big business that, that has 12,000 people working for it, which is very large in the world in the UK, um, and where blockchain can have a big impact potentially. So before we get into blockchain, in your own words, how would you explain what blockchain is to our students? Sure. Um, I guess if people are familiar with what a database is, it is, think of it like a database, but rather than having the database uh, on a computer, the database is replicated as is all over the world. And no one can change things in this database once it's out there. So things can be modified and amended, but there's a track record of every single transaction put in this database for the entirety of time, and it's distributed all over the world, which means no one controls it. Uh, I would say that is the, the easiest way for me to think about what, what a blockchain is. And what advantage does that bring over a regular database that, let's say, is secure with firewalls? And yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's a great question, because when people come and pitch to me blockchain ideas, the first question I ask them is, why can't I just use the, the, the database? What's wrong with the database? Uh, and the, the answer comes down to the, the special attribute of the blockchain, which is number one, no one controls it. So it is distributed to nature. Uh, number two it is immutability, which means you cannot change things while they're once they're written. There are other more features, but these are the base ones. Um, the first one, think of it as um, if you are trusting, right, let's say the government holds all your records, holds your social insurance number, and you trust the government is not going to change, not going to do anything wrong with it. But if you are in a world where trust is more broken, right? let's say you are living in some form of dictatorship, or let's say you're living somewhere where the rule of law isn't as strong, if you have a database that is not controlled by one person, but is controlled by a multiple number of players, where no one of them has influence over the data there, suddenly you feel much more protected rather than having to trust one organization or one individual. Similarly, even if you do trust that, that organization, do you trust them that they're saving and protecting your data in the right way? We've seen what happened with Experian, we've seen what happened with many other data breaches. Actually having your data distributed over multiple players who none of them have control over it is very helpful. And lastly, on the immutability part, this is where things that go in can be easily changed. So number one, you don't want like, some corrupt regime changing your data and saying, oh, actually, this doesn't belong to you. Uh, and also, I sometimes give the example of, I don't know if people here read uh, the book 1984 by George Orwell. Uh, and in that book, there is a very, uh, again, I, I, get, I get goosebumps to remember this, but um, if you remember, the main character works in this sort of news, in the Ministry of Truth, which deals with news coming in. And he basically, he notices that the war with country A 
doesn't, isn't really happening. I think the words with kind of should be, and someone goes back and it changes the history, right? Now, it's quite easy to do that if you think what certain regimes are doing now, deleting things in the history books, right? Uh, if things are written in the history books in the way that cannot be then unwritten, what does this mean for truth? What does this mean for things for having a real proof that something happened? Uh, so so just, just think of the implications of this in terms of having a real verifiable, unmutable source of proof. And so in your industry, specifically, I, I do want to deep, uh, do a little bit of a deeper dive in real estate. How do you feel that this would be, a blockchain would be a really interesting thing in the real estate industry? In quite a few ways. I think the, the use cases that I think of and people are talking about are probably break them into three or four main use cases. And I'll, I'll give the top level and we can go deep dive into any of those as, sure. as a few ways. Number one uh, is property rights, which goes back to the example I gave before. Uh, if you live in the UK, and I don't know how it works in the US, but if I live in the UK, I bought my house, the land registry holds the title of my house. Right? And, and, and everybody who wants to know who owns this house, who could prove I own this house, people go to land registry, and that is a single source of truth of who owns the address where I live in. The real problem is that certain countries do not have that register. Kenya, for example, doesn't have a register of land titles, right? Or certain countries have a register of land titles, but it's open to corruption. An example, I own this plot of land. Suddenly, the, know, the mayor of the town wants to give this plot of land to his cousin. Poof, suddenly his cousin owns this plot of land. Uh, and so actually helping bring property rights into uh, developing countries is a huge and very obvious use of blockchain because of the immutability and the distributed nature of the blockchain. Uh, the other, um, and we can talk about this, the other use case um, I see is just in terms of transacting real estate. So I don't know if anybody again in this class has bought real estate, sold real estate, transacted in it. You have so many parties involved. You, you have you, it's not only you and the, and the buyer, you have your lawyers, you have your mortgages, you have your bankers, you have, the, the, there's so many, I think there's like eight or nine uh, um, parties involved in this part of the transaction. If you could track it on the blockchain and make things move faster, just because the blockchain holds a, a, a chronological series of time and who's holding the button at every point in time, we could transact property quicker. And lastly, the blockchain can uh, make uh, the concept of fractional ownership easier. Uh, I think the great example people talk about is today you can <coughs> own 100% of your house or rent 100% of your house. There aren't many tools that let you do something in between, right? For example, I want to buy 25% of my house but rent 75% of it. Or, for example, I want to buy my house but I want to then sell 75% of my house to my brother, my mother, and my dad, who own equity in my house uh, in, in, in some, form, some sort of way. So blockchain, because of its this distributed nature, and you can register this ownership of the house, a rental of the house on the blockchain, um, I think is, is another great use case. So I'd like to deep dive on the last one, fractional ownership. And I do want to get do that the other two as well. There's a friend of mine, so we're going to use a real example. His name is Eli, and Eli goes to yoga class with me in Brookline, Massachusetts. He's about 30 years old. He grew up in Cambridge. His parents want to sell him the two-family house that he grew up in, but that two-family house right now costs north of a million dollars. He wants to buy half the house. He wants his brother, who has no money at all, to buy the other half. But Eli doesn't have the money. The parents want to sell the house, take some cash out, and go to Florida. Is there a way that blockchain could help them with this fractional ownership idea? Um, let, let's think about that. And first of all, I will say, again, blockchain, I, I don't know at the moment of a solution that will necessarily help, but it is more of how will the technology can potentially enable a solution that will help him. Um, one concept that I want to mention is the concept of smart contracts. Smart contracts um, 
live on the blockchain and basically these are automatically um, automatically executing orders. So for example, uh, a smart contract could be every time a hundred dollars come in from Eli's brother, right, uh, take some equity from his brother to Eli and back to his parents, right? So you can have all kinds of transactions that are, are encoded into the blockchain that enable the sort of functioning inside it. It's, it's, it's think of it as pieces of code that run within the blockchain. So smart contracts enable that. Um, I guess in Eli's, um, in Eli's example, right, a way to do that would be if Eli has a half a million dollars, but his brother doesn't have it, right? And I guess in this example, that's the case. Um, Eli could buy 50% of the equity of the house, right? And his brother could perhaps um, either sell, or let's say his brother only has 50K, right? So he can buy 5% of the house and sell the other 45%, or perhaps he could use that to mortgage the house, right? And maybe, because let's say he still wants to retain ownership of the house, right? So he can, um, perhaps mortgage it and use some of the rental incrementally to buy off the equity from his parents. So, so, so we need to think of it, right? In the end, someone needs to pay this half a million. So the question would half a million come in equity or come in debt? And that's how we bridge it. Uh, is this the case you're talking about or is this? Yes, it seems that you're, you're bringing up that Eli actually seems to have several options. If we use a smart contract, which is basically the minute something happens, the contract automatically does something else without the parents having to do something. I like the, the rent to own option that let's say the brother who doesn't have any money uh, has enough money to pay, let's say a thousand dollars in rent. Yeah. And every time he puts in a thousand dollars in rent, the smart contract will give him a thousand divided by 500,000 and say, that's your percentage of equity of the house that you just bought. And he buys it over X number of months. Yeah. It's, it's, I think that the beauty by the way of this model is that, Let's say his parents, um, basically Eli can play with the amount of money he's putting in every month above the rent to start paying off the principal and buying into the equity, right? So the parents suddenly have a great tenant because the tenant owns the place. As a landlord, one of the biggest problems you have is the gross to net effect, right? So I don't know if anybody of the, of the, of the students have owned the property, you have to pay property tax, you have to pay all kinds of other costs, you have to pay repairs and maintenance and service charges, and all kinds of costs you have to pay. Eli's brother now owns, let's say, 5% of the house. He's the tenant, but he still needs to take care of the property and make sure it is, is in good, it is good, uh, it's in good uh, um, maintenance order because he feels like he owns it. So his parents get a very nice yield on their half a million. So Eli every month pays $1,000, but Let's say Eli gets a bonus next month or gets some inheritance, he can use that to staircase. So he will then pay $10,000. With this $10,000, he will buy another 1% of the equity. His rent could stay the same or could go down a little bit, right? And then over time, he will, I say staircase, because every time he puts some money, his equity ownership goes up like a staircase. This model that exists today is called the ownership but it only works in the, um, in the sort of state aid government, right? So this is more of a social housing kind of construct uh, in the UK. Uh, in the US, there's a company called Point that is working on bringing something similar to this to the market, uh, but I don't know exactly where they are on this concept. Well, the reason that the idea interests me is that the real estate prices in Boston, where I live, are so high that they are millennials that have some money they just don't have a million dollars for a one bedroom and to be able to incrementally leg into owning a place over time would probably be really appealing to that market. Yeah. I, th I think the idea is extremely appealing to both renters and, and owners for the reasons I mentioned, right? If you're an owner, you get a much better tenant, right? The, 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 the tenant is less likely to ruin your place. It will take very good care of it. The renter loves it because he's still paying, rent, but part of that rent will go towards owning more and more, of his, more and more of his house because probably the rent will have to be market value, but anything above that goes towards the equity. Usually the main uh, blocking part of this to happen is a technology, right? You want to make sure this is where blockchain can be helpful and also it's regular, regulatory. 
the legal framework to mandate the relationship between you, the tenant, and the owner uh, isn't advanced enough, right? Those laws in various countries were written 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I think we will need to see a bit of a regulatory change to make sure what happens in bad cases, right? What happens if I don't pay the rent? Can you evict me when I own 20% of the property, right? Uh, and these questions are really, really questions that have, you need resolving before you run straight into the situation. Could you have a smart contract that had a clause that said, I give up my landlord tenant rights because I'm no longer a tenant if I actually am partially owning this. So now I'm this other being yeah. and now you just list out in the smart contract that I give up my right to squat or whatever, because I'm not really a pure tenant anymore. Therefore that law doesn't apply. Uh, maybe, but this is a question <laughs> for a lawyer. it's a question for a lawyer because in the end the court will need to decide, right? Whether this smart contract is a contract. It, it, it comes down to, to, to what the law says. And if in some countries, in the UK, for example, the law says once you're a renter over four months, you have certain rights and, and you're, you're not really able, you know, would, um, you're, not able, you're not really able to contract against these rights because the law says you cannot do that. So it's, it really varies by jurisdiction what you are and aren't able to do. You bring up a really interesting thought of what word we haven't been using at all in our conversation is a bank. Yeah. You don't need a bank. Yeah, which, which I think part of the fraction ownership idea, which I love, is the idea that you can, you can crowdsource a mortgage, right? So, again, if I, let's say, if I'm uh, Eli's brother and I have some money, wouldn't I rather, or let's say I'm just an investor, wouldn't I rather put my $100,000, instead of putting them in a bank and getting uh, half a percent, would I rather put them as a mortgage Right, provide the mortgage to Eli's brother, right? Get beautiful payment, have security of, of the property. My money get, make, makes much higher yield, and I can provide small part of this mortgage, right? So if I get, you know, let's say, I think it's a crowdsourcing for mortgages, which is, which is a concept that some people in the UK are working on. Very, very interesting. Uh, and, and it goes back to the point of allowing people to rent with more equity. Uh, so if I'm a millennial, maybe. I'll be able to get a much higher loan to value ratio if I'm able to crowdsource the mortgage. It's also interesting in that banks uh, require now that you deposit so much money that a lot of people just can't even touch it. This could be a way for people that just don't have a lot of cash but have good credit to actually start buying real estate because now it becomes something that they can actually do. Exactly. So another question regarding real estate. So we'll, we'll put the Eli, uh, put Eli aside, but let's just talk about Eli's parents. Mm -hmm. They own this million dollar home. Mm -hmm. Let's say they, they own it outright. So they just, it's just theirs. Yeah. Would they be able to using blockchain to go out to people and say, Hey, I need a home equity loan. I'll sell you one one hundredth of my house. So I still control it. You give me cash and then I'm going to pay you some interest and you have your collateral. Absolutely. I think this is one of the more exciting usages. I've, I've actually, historically, one of the projects I've worked on was trying to set a very large home equity loan operation. And the problem with home equity loans, by the way, is not enough capital wants to go into them because of the very, very long term and long nature they have. Usually what they mean is that the, the owner needs to die or move out. And then it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a complicated and, uh, and, and involved decision. Because the parents have to go to Eli and say, oh, you know your inheritance. You think you're going to get a million worth of house. Actually, you want to go to Florida. So we're going to take 200,000 equity loan uh, and you're only going to get 800. So there's quite a complicated discussion between the, the, the usually the mature older of the property and, and the kids. And in terms of the capital going in, most capital providers need to see a very clear return. They want to see 3% return per year or they want to know when the money comes back. Equity loans by nature have a very um, lumpy return profile. Now, in this scenario, if blockchain could enable to bridge the gap between this sort of huge demand for capital and huge supply of capital, right? Because I think there'll be a lot of people really, really interested in putting some money into 
those houses, which they know is going to be a long-term investment. They know it's really liquid, but you know, would I want to have $10,000 in a house in Brooklyn that I know is going to be worth one day something because I think it's probably going to go up? Probably, yes. Um, so, so I think overall it's a very attractive proposition. I think it's pretty interesting if you could do something where, let's say I am just starting out, or, or not, all I have is $10,000, I do want to invest in real estate, and that won't get you anywhere. But it would be interesting if I could have $1,000 in San Francisco, $1,000 in New York, and 8,000 in other places around the world. It seems like blockchain would be the only thing that would allow that to be able to happen operationally. Well, you see, I guess, and this is where I think the discussion about blockchain sometimes get a bit murky, right? Because fundamentally, I can achieve the same result with the database, right? So why, why the blockchain? I think the reason is it provides this, this visibility, it provides this transparency, it provides this smart contract ability that if everybody is on it and everybody's trusting it, then it will work. But you're right, I think it is, I wouldn't say it is the only method, but I think it is the easier, uh, I think it is the easier and the most straightforward and the more trustworthy way of doing these kind of transactions. Uh, I think you have to remember that the technology, and I'm sure you're discussing about this, isn't, isn't at this maturity level yet or full scale deployment of this system, right? I think some systems are out there, but I think it would be another, I don't know, 12 to 18 months, I think we see large scale uh, blockchain deployment in the wild of these, of these solutions. But it's a time to think about it, right? It is now that I'm thinking, okay, how can blockchain help me? What can I do with the technology? So from your perspective, in the real estate industry with blockchain, what, what fruit is ready to uh, be picked or getting closed? So what, what ideas are out there that are actually realistically about to be hitting market at some point in the future? Yeah, um, the uses of blockchain for uh, as a source of truth is already being worked on and quite a few companies are doing advanced trials, right? So it's still probably alpha or beta phase, uh, because the, the, if you think about what a, what, a, what a title, again, if someone holds a title, this is such a critical part, this is su such an important thing, you don't want to have any mistakes in it. Uh, many, so in the developed world, the land registries and the title manager of the world want to bring a blockchain because there's value for them. In the developing world, many people see that they, they need a benefit you can have. You just think about this for a moment, right? The reason the US uh, or I'll take it differently. A huge proportion of the US and UK's and the developed world capital is tied into houses, right? First, we can release it, but also, you know, we are able to transact and get more money because we're able to take a mortgage, right? So a lot of the economic activity is derived from having property rights and owning the property. This doesn't exist in the developing world, right? If I have a farm and I have land, but I'm unable to lend against it because I don't have a title, and I cannot take a mortgage to, to buy more seeds or whatever it is, the economic activity of my country is severely, severely hampered. And this is not theoretical, this is true in most of the developing world. So the immediate fruit on these sort of both developing world and, and developed world on the title and source of truth is that's probably the ripest of, of the elements, I believe. Uh, but not far behind are those fractional ownership, fractional mortgages, fractional rental concepts, because many people see the benefit and started working, working on the world. Okay, so the developing world with the title <clears throat> is the first one that you see going to be popping out, and then the fractional ownership. Is the fractional ownership further along in, in one country over another right now? I, I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you because, again, I need to know all the countries and what everybody's doing. Uh, Usually, U.S. players tend to make the most noise, so you will know about them, uh, <laughs> because that, 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 that's the way the game is. But um, I, I think I think there are a few players working on it. I know of three in the U.K. working on some concepts like that. So it, it is, it is being tested. The beauty is, is this is technology, right? It's all software as a service. It's all blockchain. The winner could come from Indonesia, for all we know, right? The winner could come from complete left field with an amazing system built there and just, you know, come ground root from Georgia, I don't know. So uh, you need to look quite wide to see what's happening in space. I understand. And overall, now to go back to a, a high altitude question, in the real estate industry, 
when blockchain comes into it on a, a much deeper level, and I know we are in early days, who do you think are going to be the winners and losers in real estate because of the blockchain technology coming in? Um, it's a good question. So I think you know, immediate winner, I think immediate winners will be in many ways the, the consumers and, and players in the market, right? Because blockchain really brings higher efficiency, uh, higher capital efficiency uh, to markets, right? So obviously the winners will be people operating in these fields and having the systems. Uh, it's hard for me to name, you know, a specific organization or company that would benefit. One of the I think one of the key problems with blockchains is because they're so distributed and so disorganized and somewhat anarchic, uh, that's why not many companies pick them up, right? It's more startups trying to come in and, and be disruptive and trying to do something new. Losers, um, I think the, some of the main losers would be number one, um, agency type businesses, right? Because part of what I said before, if you're a broker and you're job in life is to make a transaction move forward and suddenly you have this much easier, much smoother way to make transactions can all happen online, uh, it, brokers and agents can lose. If, if you take on one extreme, Airbnb, where you transact on a property for three days, completely online, no human intervention. On the other hand, you have, I want to buy this million square foot uh, property or let's say I'm Apple building my headquarter. This side is a very heavy agency side, you, this is zero. Um, and, and obviously you have more and more and more and more agents, the bigger you go. I think blockchain will start pushing the dial higher in terms of where you don't need an agent in the process of transactions. Maybe it would be rentals, maybe it would be in selling, I don't know, right? In the US you need to be a broker, in the UK you don't. So if there's technology that will help you, that would be quite disruptive. Um, and I guess, Back to your question about capital provision, I think people who are today sitting on the provision of capital, right? And, and you know, if I'm a bank and suddenly, you know, my mortgage product isn't so competitive because uh, consumers can go direct to other consumers and get direct peer-to-peer -peer mortgages, maybe I will be disrupted. In reality, I don't think that will happen. In reality, I think if, if this becomes attractive, the banks will themselves provide the capital in these scenarios, uh, but, but generally speaking, capital providers, if they get disintermediated, uh, we need to think about ways of getting back into these digital markets. And if we had students in our class who are in a position where they can pivot careers and they wanna do something in real estate, they wanna be ahead of the curve and they wanna be a part of blockchain on some level, are there certain jobs that you would, or, or areas of expertise that you think that they should start picking up now where they could profit from blockchain? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very hot topic and the right place to be right now in terms of, of the combination because a lot of people see the benefit and, and not many people are, again, there aren't many companies who started in this space. I think number one, if, if based on the characteristics we described, so the mutability of the blockchain, the distributed nature, the ability to have smart contracts happen automatically. If, if, this, if you see an opportunity, uh, this is the time to go for it, right? I think there's a lot of capital wanting to go into startups in the blockchain related world. In terms of actual jobs, there are quite a few startups that are taking, that are growing in the space. Uh, and so actually, you know, showing interest in those, in those startups and trying to get involved with them would be, uh, would be another place to start. Um, and, just being an expert, right? I think if someone knows a lot and reads a lot about blockchain and property and then can go and add value to some of the bigger players, it'd be highly valuable. So if you think about the CBRE and Pushman of the world and, and Douglas Elements, are they thinking about blockchain? Absolutely. But do they have enough experts, enough people who know a lot about blockchain? I don't think so. So there's an opportunity there as well, I think. Okay. And my last question, which I hope you like, is what's a great question I forgot to ask? What's something our students should know? Um, you've had a great question. I need to think of a good one. Um, 
I'll tell you what, I think you didn't mention at all ICOs mm -hmm. uh, and whatever they come up. And I would say that people talk about blockchain and ICO and Bitcoin and, and confound them a lot. And I would really separate them in people's mind and think about blockchain as just a database, a very smart database, but it's a database, right? And Bitcoin is a type of blockchain. Actually, Bitcoin runs on the Bitcoin blockchain. Ethereum runs on the Ethereum blockchain. Many ICOs also operate on the Ethereum blockchain. But I think if you think of a blockchain, you want to, what they call abstract, and, 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 and everything below the database layer. So just think about it as someone will provide me the blockchain infrastructure, I can record a transaction, it will stay there, it will immutable be great. So that's sort of separate. ICOs are just a way to perhaps raise money for your, uh, for your venture. Uh, but I think people talk a lot about it and confound these, but I haven't seen very exciting ICOs in, in the blockchain world. So again, I'm, I'm not sure what the question right, but it's, again, I, I, would, I would, if you ask me, what about ICOs? I would say, don't think about ICO. Think about blockchain as a, as a database and see what you can do about it in this world. ICO is another layer of way to access capital for a startup in the United States. Excellent. Ayo, thank you so much for all the time you spent with us. And we wish you happy holidays. And if we have any other questions, we might be uh, pinging you again. Perfect. Thank you very much thank you for your time. I, hopefully, I hope it was useful. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.